Welcome to Diffused Congruence. This is episode seven of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and I'm joined once again by my co-host Parvez Ahmed. Thank you, Zaki, and thank you, listeners, for uh, joining us again. Our guest for this episode is actor Farhan Tahir, who you have seen in movies such as Iron Man and Star Trek, as well as on television on shows such as Dallas. And uh, he has been a very vocal advocate for increasing Muslim presence in multimedia. And uh, Farhan, we're honored that you were able to join us. Well, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, so just to, just to start things off now, I think you have a fascinating personal history in terms of uh, the, the journey that you've had. You were, you were born in uh, Los Angeles? I was born in Los Angeles. Uh, my parents at that time were at UCLA studying theater and film. Uh, so that's where I was born. When they finished their studies, they went back to Pakistan. And, of course, I went with them since I had no choice at that point. I was, you know, a few years old. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So, so that is my background. I grew up there and then for a little uh, time in England and the rest of the time here. So uh, what, what was the thing that prompted you to pursue a career in the arts? Because especially, uh, I would assume at, at that time you were growing up, that was not something that uh, was, was very common, especially in, in Muslim families. Yeah, it wasn't. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, but I think the... A part of it was because, you know, I grew up in, in, in a household where we go back three generations in arts and literature. And that does have some effect on you. It wasn't that I was pushed into it by any, anyone. Uh, my family has been very open-minded, and we really believe in the fact that you should find your own interest, your own calling, your own passion. Uh, that is the only way to excel in something if you have passion for it. Uh, I've always thought about being an actor. I think uh, in the beginning, uh, just as a little personal secret. And as time went on, I realized that this is what I wanted to do. Um, there was there was a there was a peace and there was a kind of excitement that I felt when I was in theater or around you know that that environment. Did you start some of that in, in Pakistan itself uh, before you came back to the United States? You know, I, it's funny. I, as I said, I was around it a lot. Uh, I didn't do it as much in Pakistan as I did after I came to the U.S. But funnily enough, my first TV show was when I was a freshman here in college. And I went back to Pakistan for, a, um, uh, for my summer vacation and... Uh, ended up doing a TV show there. So that was that was one of the first, you know, first introductions of actually getting in front of people and performing. And and what was that project? It was a TV um, play, a teleplay, uh, directed by a very well-known Pakistani director, Saira Kazmi. And mm, yeah. funnily enough, my mother was in it, not playing my mother. So that was a bit of a trip uh, <laughs> to, to actually... In, interact with her as a as a whole other character. You know, <laughs> it was, right. it, was, it, was uh, it was a learning experience to see uh, you know, to meet my own mother as a professional. Mm -hmm. You know, rather than as my loving mother that I've known for all my life. So, so that was that was uh, that was great. And you you were how old when this when this project happened? I think I was eighteen, nineteen, something like that, something like that. Okay, so so we're talking. Uh, We're talking centuries. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was yesterday, actually. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whichever one you want to keep. It, out of it all blurs together, right? Exactly. So, uh, what what was your your first uh, uh, sort of um, tra tra you know transferring over to the states? I mean, at what point did you start looking into pursuing acting as a career here? You know, I I was an undergrad at Berkeley, um, and I had gone to Berkeley uh, to pursue economics and business as my major. And I always found myself in front of the theater. Uh, and slowly, uh, I started to find myself in those classrooms rather than not just in front of the theater building. And it started this strange, I wouldn't call it a battle, but this dialogue within me of 
what I thought I should be doing and what I, what my heart wanted me to do. Hmm. Uh, and I, I was fortunate enough to have a really wonderful, sensitive advisor who, who looked at my transcripts and said, well, what gives? I mean, how are we going to put this together? You're, <laughs> you're almost you're schizophrenic here, uh, and we need to find some bridge, or you won't graduate for another 25 years. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so let's let's find some some way of bridging this gap, uh, and we did. Uh, I was focusing on uh, economics and business models in developing countries at that point. That wow. was my focus. Uh, and what we found was that if we if we started to look at theater or performing arts in developing countries and applying some of the the business side of it to to that and how that has fared and also how the expression changes when uh, there was a change in the political system or ideologies or economic systems, what does that do to um, uh, to the artistic expression. So that is what I ended up focusing on. And that kind of, in a strange way, opened up a lot of avenues for me. Uh, then I could take courses in business and economics and anthropology and sociology and, and literature and, and all of it. So, so kind of, it kind of uh, I think in the end, I ended up with a, a much richer, deeper education uh, than I would have otherwise. Right. And of course, then I went off I decided when I graduated from there, I ended up working in theaters for about six years and then pursued my, my graduate level work, um, you know, in theater at mm -hmm. Harvard. That's right. Uh, and, and so then what, I, I guess from there, did you automatically, uh, like your trajectory was already sort of Hollywood bound or were you still maybe considering going back to, you know, to the arts or to theater or to the, 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 the television and film industry back home? Well, I mean, it, it has always been all of that. You know, hmm. uh, Hollywood came a little later. Uh, my, you know, ideological belief is that quality counts. Yeah. Uh, and I think that should be our belief anyway. Uh, I ended up working in theaters for a very long time because I was looking at Hollywood and at that point... There weren't um, any real uh, options and in, 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 in characters uh, that were that you know that you could find some depth to. Uh, theater, on the other hand, is a whole other beast. If you if you have a command over verse, you can do Shakespeare, uh, and nobody really cares what color you are, what religion you are, what faith you are, because the visuals are by by, by the, I mean, just by walking into a theater and giving up this idea that by turning on a light it's day and by turning it off it's night, That's right. uh, you know, you you you're suspending that belief, and, and I think that that also translates onto stage uh, as to who is performing for you, as long as they're believable, as long as they, as long as they can execute the, the character and the story well. So I ended up working in theater for a long time uh, and then transitioned over to, uh, to film and, uh, and television here when I thought there, were, there was a little bit more of a, you know, a, an opportunity to do something that was not just you know, stereotypical or not just you know, uh, one-dimensional. So your, your first feature was uh, The Jungle Book, I believe. Yes, it was. That was uh, Stephen Summers. Yes, it was. Uh, so, so how, how how did that happen? How did you end up uh, uh, landing a role in that? How did that happen? I mean, it's funny. I was uh, doing a show off Broadway, uh, and it was during that time that I was uh, asked to audition for it, which I did. And then, for the longest time, I didn't hear anything back from them. And then one day, I am in performance, and I look out, and there is the casting director sitting right smack dab in the middle of the audience, like staring at me, <laughs> which is a little disconcerting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and apparently, what had happened was, I mean, you know, these things can take their own life, um, 
apparently they have looked at the tape. They have, they have been considering me at that point. I didn't have enough creds as a film or TV actor. Uh, they wanted to make sure that I was the right person. Uh, you know, and then one thing led to another. Next thing I knew was that I got a call from them. Uh, it was, and uh, you know, again, it's, it's it's really luck that I just had finished my my show on stage, and literally three or four days later, I get a call from the producer saying, "We want you to do this." And I said, "Well, I would love to do it." And they said, "Well, can you hop on a plane today?" <laughs> and then I thought he was kidding, right? But he really was not kidding. <laughs> Uh, they really wanted me to hop on a plane that day, which I did, uh, and went off and, and did it. Wow. So, well, as things in Hollywood go, you know, coming around full circle and the incestuous nature of the, of the industry, uh, it looks like they're, they've, they've greenlit another Jungle Book with John Favreau directing, right? So, oh, oh, there you the, go. The, yeah, so maybe, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe you might be in the new one, too. <laughs> who knows? Who knows, right? I think I should write to John and say, hey, man, well, what's, what's up? <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> So that that was uh, about twenty years ago. Do you really have to say? Yeah, that was twenty years ago. <laughs> wow. Now, now, so so your first movie. I mean, what what was your immediate? What, what was that transition like going from stage to film? You know, stage to film is a. It's it's you know the the, the technique remains the same. I think where you need to switch your mind is the frame. Uh, and if you're aware of it, and if you know how to do it, and sometimes it takes a little bit of adjustment, uh, because on stage you're using, you know, for, I guess the word is your entire instrument, because the person watching you is watching all of you, and you are expressing yourself with all of you, because the person in the front seat has to get the same effect as the person in the back seats. And you got to find that kind of, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, bigness or, or, or whatever you want to call it. Right. Uh, on the other hand, film and television is very different because your emotion and all that has to still find the same anchor that you would find on stage. And yet you can say the same thing physically by literally raising an eyebrow. Uh, raising an eyebrow on stage might not be the, uh, the way to kind of convey something. But on film, it could be something as subtle as that. So you, you got to make that mental switch of keeping the truth of the character intact and yet uh, applying a slightly different technique of how to express that truth. Hmm. So, well, um, now, g- given, I mean, just the, the body of work that you've accumulated, you, you're obviously uh, one of the most prominent Muslim personalities that that's working in the industry, and what what are some of the challenges you've encountered as far as uh, fi- you know you you mentioned you alluded to sort of the the struggle with with stereotypical characters and things like that, mm-hmm. and just sort of uh, uh, embodying uh, your own uh, faith. You know, uh, see the way I look at it is that, of course, as an artist, you can't go in with an agenda, right? Because I think there is you have to say true to the character, to to who you are and how you express yourself. Because whatever comes out of me, my faith, my history, my personality, my idiosyncrasies, all are, are, are create that prison mm-hmm. for, for the story or, or the, the information to be refracted. Given that, my struggle always is, not to show the faith or me or an ethnicity or whatever in any glorified or any demonized way. I think the idea is to show the character as human as you possibly can. Uh, and if you can find those layers, if people can identify with you on a human level, then it becomes easier for people to, to understand who we are. You know, there, there's such a wide range of, of Muslims or Christians or, or Jews or whatever, whatever, whatever you, you want to call it. There's no one, one uh, myopic, small definition of who we are. It's a much bigger umbrella. And to me, the, the idea is that whenever it's stereotypical in one way, which is, let's say, in a negative way, then how do I find the humanity in this person? Hmm. When, it's, when it's stereotypical in the other way, when it's too positive, how do I find the vulnerabilities of this character. Right. And that's that's what I try to work for. 
Right. And what I find interesting is, is that, you know, just looking, I mean, again, uh, without sort of going to your IMDb page and, and cheating, um, you know, just looking <laughs> at some of the roles that I've seen you in, at least personally, you know, you've done sort of the full gambit. I mean, you like, for example, I think your role in, in both Star Trek and Elysium, you know, they're not, I mean, you play the president for God's sake, right? I mean, in Elysium and, 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 and in Star Trek, you're playing a, 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 a captain. So they're not, they're not, you know, those are not ethnically driven or, you know, they're not based on your own personal, you know, background. So that's, that's really fascinating, I think, in terms of your career. Yeah. You know, the other thing, the other thing we, one has to be very sensitive to is that, you know, you got to say true to the character. So one, one thing that I am very aware of is that if, for some reason, I have done two or three characters which are, say, a bad guy or a good guy, you also have to look at the body of work that you're presenting. Uh, Hmm. So if I do two or three bad guys or two or three good guys, then I should be able to, and I should, switch it over. I Hmm. should give a different variety, uh, a different, different taste of what I can offer. Sometimes I succeed in it, sometimes I don't. I think that's also part of it. But I think you got to be sensitive to that. If you keep on doing one thing too much, then you become a, a one-trick pony. So I think, you know, sometimes you can find that variety within the character, and sometimes you have to find that variety within the body of work that you're presenting. So yeah, I mean, I've been fortunate enough to do, you know, to do, to be able to do Star Trek and play the captain uh, and play the president in Elysium, but by the same, by the flip of it, you know, a play the bad guy in Iron Man or a prison inmate in Escape Plan. So, you know, I mean, you, you got to find that variety for yourself and for the audience. Well, and, and I think, I think it's safe to say that probably the, the work of yours that m- most audience have seen is probably Iron Man. Um, what was your approach to that character? I mean, how, how you know, it's, it's very easy to make uh, Raza a very sort of stereotypical villain. And I, I actually think he's yeah. he's got a little bit of complexity. I think he's very interesting. So uh, was that something that you sort of constructed on your own? Is that something you collaborated with Favreau with on? You know, I was fortunate. That was a really great experience. And I'll tell you why. For uh, just a few reasons. One was that when I look at the script, uh, and I've said this before many times, that there were a lot of allusions. We were talking about faith and all that you know, right. a second ago. And there were a lot of allusions to, to the faith in it. Mm. Uh, and it, that it wasn't uh, because I, I had enough conversations with them, and I, I know that it wasn't done for any nefarious reason. It was, it was probably done because of lack of, of knowledge right. or, or depth or understanding. And when I and other people, when we offered a, an alternative to that, uh, the producers, the writers, the director, much to my delight, were very open to having that dialogue, you know, which, uh, and my, my, my argument to them was that, you know what, that if this was a movie that was based on realistic events, yeah, are there good guys, are there bad guys? Yeah, there are. But we're talking about a, super, uh, a superhero movie, right? We're not talking about, uh, you know, r- realism here. So it's not Argo, right? So, I mean, so, so why are we why are we basing this character's actions on an ideology that is so so anchored in reality? Mm-hmm. Why can't these people be more of a you know soldiers of fortune or or that you know they will do anything for power? Which to me is a real definition of, of terrorism anyway, rather than faith or ideology. I think it's its power. And it's control. Anyway, uh, given that, we were able to take some of those illusions out, uh, which was great. Uh, we could. We also worked on trying to give this guy a real history. Because the way I look at bad guys is not that you don't get up in the morning and you go, you, go, you know what, I'm going to be a really bad guy today. <laughs> you know, the, the, the way any bad guy works is that he or she completely in his or her mind can justify their actions. They find their actions to be the the right thing to do at that moment, however convoluted or however sick or evil that might be. But for that guy or for that woman, that is the right path to take. And once you start to do that, you also start to see that, you know, this guy might have 
within his evil construct or his his bad intents, he has his own desires. He has his own own dreams. Uh, and and how do you tap into those? There's a vulnerability there. Uh, and how do you tap into that kind of a thing? So so yeah, I mean, some of it, of course, I brought what I could. Uh, John was really good at shaping and and you know talking it out where it was too much, where it was too little, and then you know it, it, this is a collaborative effort. Um, now, in in terms of in terms of that idea of of collaborating, I mean, you've you've worked with some pretty uh, hefty directors. I think some some of the the most important directors out there right now, and I mean. Uh, whether we're talking about J.J. Abrams or, um, of course, on, on Elysium with um, uh, uh, with Blomkamp, uh, can you can you describe the the collaboration you had with these directors and how do they vary from project to project? Hmm, that's a good question. You know, uh, you have to understand whenever you go into collaboration with anybody, I think you have to understand uh, their way of working. Uh, you you need to understand what kind of a dialogue you're going to have with a person. Sometimes a director might come in and they might have a very specific idea of what they want out of you. Now, then it becomes your job how to find, how to add to that what you're bringing to it and how to engage the person in the, in, in the conversation where it becomes a collaboration rather than a, a singular vision. Mm-hmm. Uh, in case of J.J. Abrams, uh, J.J. is one of those people who who knows exactly what he wants, and he's very good at it, but he's also somebody who will listen to you wholeheartedly and with all his focus, no matter what is going on. And that is true not only for the actors, it could be the guy who is that day in charge of lunch. <laughs> and I think mm-hmm. what, what that does is that that... that gives you this confidence and this trust uh, that you want to rise above and go beyond what you're capable of because you feel a part of a, of a team. Uh, Neil is, is a person who's very laid back, who wants you to kind of explore it on your own. All he goes, like, yeah, 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 that is good, man. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, he's, he's that kind of a guy. But he knows where he's taking it. So he might do, he might do four different takes, of, of the same scene. JJ might do four different takes of, you know, four same takes of the same scene, but both will find their own way to get there. And you have to be pliable enough without losing your own identity and your own voice and your own point of view to be able to find that balance. So, uh, now we, you've got a, a film in theaters right now called Jin, and, and we'll definitely. I want to. I want to unpack that a little bit with you. But uh, before we get to that, I, you did. An, you had an extended run on Dallas uh, over the. Zucky's <laughs> a big fan. Yeah. So. I, uh, I'm. I'm a. I'm a fanatical <laughs> fan of Dallas, going back to the. Are you really? I, I am. I. In, in fact, unabashedly. Let me let me put it this way. I was watching an episode of the original show a couple weeks ago. And you'll appreciate this, actually. Uh, it was it was like a, a, a wedding episode, and it's uh, like this is the old school show. Right, and Cliff right, Barnes right. gets up and he tries to interrupt the wedding, and and my five year old happens to walk in at that moment. He says, "Oh, is, is that a bad guy?" And my three year old says, "No, no, that's Cliff." <laughs> So, so I, I've got, I've got, I'm, I'm legit when it comes to this. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so I need to ask you: Do you have any stories about the late great Larry Hagman? You know, there, I do have a really, really wonderful story. Wow! Um, it was literally three weeks before he passed away. Uh, he and I did the scene, uh, which which takes place, if I remember correctly, in my apartment. You know, there's, there's this little, not a showdown, but this this interaction between him and him and him and me, and it was done later at night. Uh, we got done. We were both staying at the same hotel, and we shared uh, the car together. And he said, "You know what? Um, let's go have dinner." So wow. we, we went out to dinner, he and I, and we we're talking. And the amount of love 
and the kind of dedication he had to his craft was amazing. And during that, uh, I mean, he, he opened up. He told me about things that I don't think that, you know, I mean, I, I felt so privileged that he would, he would open up personally uh, that much that night. And I, what I also witnessed in him was that while we were having this dinner, this guy came up all starstruck and tongue-tied hmm. and wanted to take a photograph with him. Uh, you know, Larry Hagman being a legend in television. Yeah. Uh, and he looked at him and he, he said, hey, come sit down with me for a second. And the guy sat down and he said, hey, what's your name? And the guy told his name. He said, look, I'm having uh, a dinner with a good friend of mine. And I understand that you want to take a, a picture. But the thing is that if I do it now, it might draw some attention to us. And then this little moment that I'm having with my friend will be lost. Hmm. It will become all about a photo op. And I would really appreciate it if, if you would, you know, if we could not have a photograph right now. And the, uh, what I loved about that was that rather than shooing the guy away or whatever, he actually engaged him in a beautiful conversation, made him understand, you know, the, the real reason why he wouldn't take a photograph. And I, and I think by doing so, he taught me how to be graceful about, about how, to deal, how to deal with these situations. Mm-hmm. And, and to me, that, that, was, that was a beautiful lesson. All of it. That entire evening is something that's going to stand in, you know, in my memory for, for as long as I live. Wow. Because he opened up, he showed his grace, he showed his bravery. Uh, he also told me that he was going to be, that they will have to take him off the screen, even if he has to get on screen in a gurney. <laughs> wow. You know, who was, who was to know that within three weeks he was going to go? You know? wow. But it was, it, was, it was an amazing moment for me. Yeah, and I mean, the mere fact of of sort of getting to spend time with, like you say, this legend. I mean, that's that's really, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and 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 just sort of picking up off that. I mean, what what have been some of the encounters that you've had with with people who recognize you? Do you have any any uh, fun stories that you can share about that? You know, look, I I I always think people are so well meaning. First of all. And I have usually found people to be very respectful uh, of of your privacy, of your time. Uh, And and, and at the same time, I also think, you know, to some extent, if somebody is is coming up to me to show their appreciation of what I do, you know what, what, without them appreciating or giving me their honest opinion or their feedback, I can't do what I do. They are part of what I do. If I just wanted to do something on my own, I would have chosen to be an accountant. Hmm. But I didn't. You know? So I think there's, there's a fine balance that I have to keep. And again, taking the, the example of, of Larry, there are times when you do have to nicely say that, you know what, if, if it's possible, let's do it a, a little later or maybe not or whatever. So, you know, you do find that balance. But I am never... Uh, taken aback or offended when people have come up. You know, I always find it to be really, really heartening that somebody is taking the time out, out of their life, to come and talk to me. So I think, I think it's, uh, for me, it's, it's a moment of growth also. <laughs> have you hit up any Star Trek conventions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Star Trek com- conventions are, are a trip. <laughs> they're, they're a trip. That's 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 a very polite way of putting it. I'm sure I'm sure you've met some very interesting people, though. Uh, they, they are. Look, I mean, I think I think they're diehard fans. Yeah. I think. Uh, look, I I am a bit of a trekkie myself, so I totally see where they're coming from. I think uh, it's it's a modern day, you know, uh, pop culture, you know, saga. It's like Odyssey. It's it's Homer. It's yeah. you know, I mean, it's create it creates a, an entire world with values and 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 cultures and and personalities you know i think i think it's 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 quite an ingenious uh, creation well and and i think it says something very interesting about the fact that you know you your screen time in in the the 09 movie is you know about 10 minutes let's say yeah right right uh, but you're a part of this universe now like i mean this is like forever you're 
a part of this giant Star Trek machine. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, it's, it's yeah, it, yeah. I, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I am. Um, as I said, I'm a bit of a Trekkie. <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the joke between JJ uh, and and me is that you know what? In soap operas and science fiction, nobody really dies unless you decapitate them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so who knows? You know, I mean, there might be uh, a circling back. Uh, of things because we we have created this continuum uh, with this new movie. All oh, right, yeah. You know where you can go either way. You can go back. You can go forward. You can see which parallel reality you're you're uh, working in and, and intersections of that those realities. Right. So we'll see. Yeah. Well, we're, we're talking about J.J. Abrams, so I, I feel like I, I it's my duty to ask. And any chance you'll show up in in Star Wars? You know, from your lips to God's ears, man. I mean, <laughs> that happens. That would be that would be a coup uh, to have been able to do Star Trek and Star Wars. You know, right. both of those those caps. <laughs> so I I, yeah, I, I teach a, a debate class, and I was teaching a class just before I I came on here to talk to you, and it and it's a, a school with um, a primarily Muslim students, and I mentioned, oh, I'm going to be interviewing Farhan Dyer, and everyone says, oh, Farhan Dyer, like every, everyone knows you. Oh, that's that's very nice. That's and, very well, and I and I think that's very interesting because I think uh, certainly in in the Muslim community you, you have become something of a role model because of the way you have broken through into the mainstream. Um, and that's that's the, the the question I have for you is we we live in a time where obviously the the question of how Muslims are portrayed in the media. Uh, how Muslims are perceived in the media. You know, this is this is very much out there in, in kind of the cultural ether. Uh, what advice do you have for kind of the next generation that's coming up that's going to be encountering this? Well, look, uh, the way I look at it is that, you know, I, I think, uh, as I said earlier, you know, I think any faith is a very large umbrella. And we shouldn't forget that. I think uh, we, we are, faith should should never falter. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we should never shy away from who we are because that is part of our identity. Uh, What the bigger challenge is, is this in my mind, that when you are faced with, well, let's not say injustices with, 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 with ideas that might not be true. Misperceptions. Misperceptions, right? How do you engage the person, the people, the group, in a dialogue and find a tone that is not combative. Hmm. Because I think sometimes when this happens, our emotions take over and we tend to let go of a dialogue. (coughs) Excuse me. I think what happens is the minute that happens, both sides, the walls go up and we try to prove our own point. Right. I think the challenge is how do you so so in, in my in my in my mind I think the best way to combat it combat that is to equip yourself with, with the knowledge as much as you possibly can and then not lo- not lose your cool while you're dialoguing with someone hmm. and also Keep yourself open that it is not just proving my point. It is also, the challenge is also to listen to the other person's point mm-hmm. and find growth in that. It's not my word against your word. It, the, it's, it has to be more of a conversation. And for, for the younger generation that's coming up, I think that's going to be, that's going to be the bigger challenge because as, especially, you know, yeah. Now that we are part of this society, right. uh, we, we, you know, for all practical purposes, I think most of us who are here, let's be very honest, yeah. are here to stay. Right. And, and we're going to be part of the fabric of the society. And in, in, in order to be the, uh, a part of the society, we need to be able to have these dialogues and not always find, uh, you know, corners or teams or whatever. Right. How do you how do you keep those 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 conversations those those interactions open? So yeah, I think I think it's a big challenge. It's it's a challenge for me. It's a challenge for you and the generation coming up. 
uh, there is we we do need to we cannot be complacent though hmm. because I think we are at that point right now that once these ideas or these um, these um, images of us solidify, mm-hmm. it will be very hard to break them. Right. So we have to make sure that we are not complacent, but at the same time not combative. Right. Uh, I think we need to find that balance somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Uh, we do need to be, I think, by the same token. We have to be honest ambassadors on both sides. Right. And the reason I say that is this, that there are times when I've heard even our own people sure. have really terrible stereotypes of other people. Absolutely, yeah. Right? And, and I think we need to be honest ambassadors in that moment. We need to make sure that when that happens, that not only that we also challenge that as much as we challenge others when they have stereotypical ideas about us. Sure. And I think that is the more honest way to, uh, you know, to approach it. Yeah, and well, and uh, you know the, the the idea of standing for truth, no matter who that truth is is directed towards. You know, I mean, I think um, absolutely, yeah. Uh, and and I th- I think you you in 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 some small way you alluded to that just with your conversations with with the Iron Man team. Uh, in in terms of sort of advocating without, like you said, you know, you're, you're not complacent but not combative. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, and and in a, in a small way, I mean, I think that that did make a difference, and and I think that's that's very telling. I mean, just circling back around to that film, I mean, the the way that section of the story is is set, it it could have been very easy, you know, as you alluded to, to take it in sort of an anti-Muslim or uh, Islamophobic uh-huh. direction. Yeah, yeah. And I think yeah. it says something that you don't you don't really come away with that in your mind, you know. Well, I hope not, because I mean, we try to do really. I mean, there was some obvious things that we did and there were some little subtle things that we tried to do like there are even little exchanges with my gang I use many a few different languages right you know, you know yeah. uh, I, I use Urdu I use Arabic I use Pashto I use even use Hungarian a little bit to show that this is a ragtag team of people from all over right you know just so that it doesn't pinpoint geographically uh, a group of people or ideologically a group of people or religiously a group of people. Right. You know, uh, the other thing we tried to do was the character, we tried to make him so that whatever garb you put on him, in this particular case, because he was on the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan, right. he could be in that garb. But by the same token, if the same guy could be in an opera in Germany wearing a tuxedo, right. hopefully you will believe it. You know, right. so, so it, it, it was those kind of things that, that I think you offer it up to people. Not everybody's going to take all of that, but you offer it up for people to have as a as a layered cake. They can decide how many layers they want to enjoy. Right. Probably. Well, and, and plus, uh, we got to hear Jeff Bridges speak Urdu, which is just... Uh... <laughs> yeah, we had fun with that one. <laughs> I, I, I love the, just the way he says that, right? Yeah, it's it's a very it's it's so it sounds like Jeff Bridges speaking Urdu, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that was that was the whole thing because we he, because I was the one who gave him the words, and then he and I had a really great conversation about this that how well do we want him to speak it, or huh. is there or is there some some real uh, I don't know hateful thing that he mutilates the language hmm. deliberately. You know, so I mean, those, those are fun things that you do as an actor, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I don't know. I mean, I, 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 those are, I don't know, those are great moments that you can have. Like, you know, so do we want him to have, like, really a great authentic accent? Or is he, or is he, ha- does he have this kind of a superiority thing yeah. that he wants to impose? You know, I don't know. So there's fun there's No, fun that's, thing. I mean, that, that really gives an insight into the process. And I mean, and obviously we, uh, uh, Robert Downey's, propensity for improvising is is sort of legendary i'm sure you yeah. had a real interesting back and forth with him too oh, yeah i i, I have I mean, the story that i've told many times which i love is that when we when we went for the screen test you know robert and i screen tested for it together uh, because they wanted to see a chemistry between the two of us uh, and 
right outside, right before we went in, you know, I had never met him. Uh, we introduced ourselves and he said, do you want to go over the lines? And I said, yeah, let's do that. And then he goes, you know what, we're going to go in there. They're going to throw a lot of stuff at us. Uh, all I'm saying is, whatever you need to do to me, smack me around, whatever, do it. I'll do the same. We'll come out, we'll hug, and apologize, <laughs> whatever. But, you know, let's have fun. Let's get in there. Let's, let's, not, let's not stop. And John made us do the same scene, I think, seven, eight, nine times wow. in different, different ways. And that, that, it's a testament to what a great actor Robert is. You know, uh, and it, it makes you, when, you, when you're working with a great actor, it makes you bring your A game to it, too. You know, I mean, we could we change it up so many times. I think the last one was literally John came out and I said, you know what, just do it as an old married couple. Hmm. You know, and wow. so, I don't know. I, I, so so that, that, kind of, that kind of interaction, that kind of freedom, that kind of trust goes a long way. You know, and I think he's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant actor. I think I've said this to his face, that he's not only, no matter what genre you throw at him, he doesn't only fit in it, he will shine in it. Yeah, and, and, you know, and that, and he, he is amazing, no doubt. Yeah, and, and, and obviously the the personal journey that he's gone on over the past 20 years is sort of just an amazing narrative in and of itself. Like, I feel like that's a movie that should be made, you know? True, and I think it has, it, he has learned tremendous humility from it. He has learned tremendous perspective from it. Um, and I think he is a better person, actor, human being because of it. Right. Sometimes you need that contrast in your life to know what is valuable. Right, right. Well, and, and I, I think that allows us a good way to segue to your current project, which is in theaters right now. Uh, and, and this is, of course, the film Jin, directed by Ajmal Zahir Ahmed. And uh, so this, this is kind, kind of a, a revolutionary thing in that it's drawing from, uh, uh, you know, uh, an Islamic culture. It's drawing from, from uh, uh, traditions that aren't really, we don't, we don't see them that often in, in mainstream Hollywood movies. So, uh, for, for, I'm, I'm guessing a large chunk of our audience will not have seen this. So maybe you can give us a little sense of what, what your role in the project is and then, and how you, uh, came to it. Yeah. I mean, uh, without giving, without giving too much about the storyline, because I, I think people should see it. Um, you know, the attempt was, as you said, to bring this other idea of jinn uh, to uh, to the forefront. Right. Uh, this idea that is, you know, very very well known in the East, but not as well known in the West. Uh, here, Hollywood has made, you know. Gin has become the blue genie out of a bottle kind of a thing. Right. You know, rather than um, a force or a being or a spirit to, you know, to actually come to, uh, come to terms with. Right. Uh, so that was the attempt to kind of find this other, other side to this whole, I, I don't want to call it mythology because it, it is, you know, it's, it's, uh, Jin is spoken about in the Quran. It's, it's, it's alluded to in, in, in the Old Testament. Right. You know, so, so it's not it's not just a mythology. You know, it's 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 um, it's more than that. Right. Right. So, so that's you know that was the attempt. Uh, of course, audiences will decide how successful or how you know unsuccessful that was. We we will leave that up to them. As far as my character is concerned, I think it is very intriguing because I play this man who is on the edge of sanity and insanity when you first meet them. Um, he is shackled to the middle of a floor in a mental asylum with a straitjacket on. Uh, and to me, that was a great challenge because you're not, you're not creating a linear character who goes, who progresses forward. You meet him almost in the middle and then you go back and forward and see what this character is about. And, and finding that, that edge of sanity and sanity where you can you can flip or trip into either one of them was was a great challenge for me to kind of find and how to make that believable and how to make that work for you and what points you choose uh, where your insanity takes over or, or your sanity takes over and and um, 
Well, this, this is uh, Ajmal Ahmed. Is this is his uh, debut uh, feature, I believe? Yes, I think I think he has done a couple of other smaller, uh, you know, uh, features. But yeah, this is his, his big one. So, so uh, you've you've talked about your collaboration with with J.J. Abrams and and John Favreau. I mean, that this this is uh, must have been kind of a, a new and different experience for you. It was. It was. Um, you know, I think the the collaboration here was also. You know, Ajmal also wanted me to bring my own research and le- legitimacy to the mm-hmm. character and to the story, and that's what I worked a lot on. And it, and it made me think a lot about things. Uh, the the very fact that even the last chapter of the Quran mm-hmm. talks about man and jinn right. kind of brings this strange le- legitimacy to to this whole idea, right? You know, uh, so I did my research on it, uh, and that was, you know, the collaboration there was how do I anchor these, this character and this story in something that's, that's more than just uh, an idea or, or a, you know. Fantasy. Or, or fantasy, exactly. Yeah. Well, and, and I, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, from, from what I've read, I mean, the goal is to hopefully carry that. Uh, like you said, I don't want to use the word mythology, but you know the, the narrative world of the the story forward yeah, into future yeah. installments. Well, the other thing it does is that you know, look, I mean, I think there is there's great value in in being able to offer people something more than look. News we can't change. News is what it is. But I think we there is real power in storytelling. I think we can connect with people on so many levels when there's a an enjoyable story unfolding in front of you. And I I'm hoping that you know, stories like Jen or you know or these or of this nature can also give a a different view, a different layer, a different perspective to people of who we are. Right. Well and and I think uh there there's a I can find sort of a thematic link in terms of taking old and familiar stories and interpreting them in new ways with with the the new Noah movie that's in theaters right now. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to see that. I haven't seen it yet. No. Uh, I mean, it's th- that that's that's one that I've gotten asked a lot and uh, about a lot just as a critic. And you know, it's uh, my response is always, well, it's not the f- interpretation of the story that you're maybe expecting, but I think it's. It, it makes you look at that story in a new and interesting way. So, I mean, I, I think there's always value in that, regardless of sort of... Uh, yeah, because, look, I mean, look, the other thing that I think is that, you know, it's... We, we are creating stories, right? Uh, some of those stories are fact-based, and some of those stories are not fact-based. Right. But I think you're absolutely right. What it does do is that it does give you this opportunity to go back and look at the factual story, you know, it gives you this this entree, this doorway, this 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 opportunity to actually find. It. I mean, yeah, nobody is saying that I, I haven't seen Noah. That that this is how history unfolded, right? You know, <laughs> you know. The idea is that okay, now you know people. Who knows? There, there might be people who don't know who Noah is. Mm-hmm. There are. There might be, but now they do, and therefore they have the opportunity to go back. And do their own research and find the real story. <laughs> so I think I think there is there is value to that. Right. Yeah. And 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 I think uh, it it's 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 always good to just have these conversations. You know. I mean. I think I think uh, these are always stories that are worth telling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I know that uh, coming up in a few weeks there is the Muslim Advocates uh, Gala, uh, right? And and your your co chair. Yes, of that event. So, so I figured this this could be a good opportunity for you to kind of talk about that organization and uh, what what the expectations are and what you're hoping to achieve with with that event. Well, you know, I think Muslim Advocates is is really a wonderful, wonderful organization because I think what they what they stand for is making sure that our rights are not trampled upon 
they also what they what I also love is that they're not just doing it for Muslims. They're making sure that that they also offer their services to other ethnic groups, other faiths, other people, uh, create those bridges. And I think that's what drew me to them. Uh, they have been they have been great advocates uh, for for causes for for you know making sure that 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 Congress and the society and the judicial system does have the right framework hmm. to interpret uh, certain things in, in in the society. So yeah, that's that's their attempt. Uh, they have had series of these of these galas where they bring. Uh, prominent people in, and, and have a dialogue with them. And they're not just politicians always. They're people from all walks of life. And I think it's important to create those dialogues because we're not going to solve these issues in one conversation. I right. think there has to be a series of, of conversations. And I think it's, 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 their, it, it's their way of creating those opportunities for people to interact with each other. Right. So we're hoping that this gala you know, uh, does that this time also. And 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 the event will be. Um, I should pull up that information. It's it's going to be in the Bay Area, I believe. It's going to be in, in, in the Bay Area on May third, I believe. Uh, <laughs> so you know, so yeah, I, I hope people can join us. For sure, absolutely. And and uh, I mean, what what other uh, projects do you have in the pipeline? What what uh, what are you hoping to accomplish within the next uh, few months? What. Actually, sorry, from before you go there. I mean, I, I mean, I, I want to kind of maybe just quickly just circle back to some some of the things that you 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 kind of alluded to earlier in your conversations about Muslims and the arts in general. Um, what do you think in terms of just the 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 response from the Muslim community has been to some of the work and projects that you've done? I mean, some of the direct kind of response and feedback that you've gotten uh, has been. You know, I, I've been very fortunate, I have to say. I've, I've gotten very good, a warm response from people. I, I, at the same time, I do encourage Muslims and, and people in general. And this is, this, is, this is a shout out to actually parents, really, that don't hold back your kids from exploring this side of, of life or, or this particular field. Because I think media is is a huge tool right now. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think the more of us who can who can enter it from different angles, from different sides, I think the better it is because then we add the voice uh, in this global world that we live in now where I can sit here and, you know, communicate with somebody in, in, in Pakistan or, or, or Doha and figure out what they're eating as they put it in their mouth. I think there's great power to, to that. And, and I think we should be able to to encourage our our you know our next generation to to explore this. Uh, having said that, uh, I have been as I said I've been very fortunate. I think I've gotten more positive responses than negative ones. Are there negative responses? Yeah, you know hmm. people people go you know why did why did you play this character or that character? Because you know what, <laughs> you know, the, the truth is that you know there are all kinds of people within within our Within our community, yeah. some are good, some are bad, and, and it's my responsibility to show all those sides, and I'm not going to shy away from that. Right, right. Now, like, and, and I mean, I imagine you know, just given your body of work, I mean, you, you've been approached by uh, by international film industries. I mean, you know, in particular, I'm, I'm thinking of Bollywood and you know the Indian film industry, industry, and you know, back home in Pakistan. Um, what, what's been sort of the approach that you've you've taken? With regards to those type of invitations, it's you know I am always open to them. I think there should be no boundaries uh, as far as art is concerned. I think we should. Uh, I have done stuff in Pakistan. Uh, to me, it's always about a good story, uh, and it's about a you know the subject matter. So you know, any time and every time that something like like that has come up, I did a TV series serial in Pakistan a couple of years ago. Okay. Just because you know, I think I think it's important. I I get to learn from them, and I can also share what I know with them. I think that those interactions are very important. 
Well, and and uh, and as I was alluding to earlier, I mean, what what are your upcoming projects that you'd like to get the word out about? Or that you can, uh, or that you can. yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm starting a, a movie in May called Kids vs. Monsters, which is kind of a kids movie, which will be fun. Uh, I'm also uh, leaning towards uh, doing a, a a little bit more producing of oh, content. Okay. Uh, which, which is, I think, a natural progression for me. Uh, the other thing that I'm very excited about is I am part of this company we're launching, um, hopefully next year, oh. which would be a media funding company, which actually curates, uh, creates, and even commissions content wow. that we think needs to be brought to, to the world. Uh, it's, so that is something that we are very seriously looking at it because I think there's no dearth of good ideas out there. Right. But the conversation always comes to a halt when you ask, do you have the funding for it? You know, so I think That's we right. need to put those two together as much as possible, create a marketplace where good ideas and brave funding or investors can find each other and, and, and you know, bring good stories to uh, to people, so so that's you know so those are the those are the projects that I'm working on. So, so some of them are actual acting, some of them are uh, producing, some of them are creating this this kind of you know funding resources for for uh, for media. Wow. Well, I, I think that's a that's a great place to to leave it. Uh, uh, Farhan Tahir, where where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me on Facebook, you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, you know, you can go and there's a page, a fan page, you can go to that. Uh, there is a uh, Farhan Tahir123 Twitter handle that you can, you know, come and visit me on. Uh, <laughs> I try to I try to say hi whenever I can. Uh, so yeah, those are, those are two good places. If people want to go to the IMDB page and see what is going on with me, that's, that resource is always there. Or just come talk to me when you see me somewhere. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great. Well, you know, uh, as we set up top, yeah. we, we've been really excited about uh, potentially getting you on to our show. So we're very excited to finally make that happen. And, and we're looking forward to seeing uh, what other projects you have coming up. No, I appreciate spending this time with you. I think this was it, it was a lot of fun for me. Uh, to have this conversation with you guys. So thank you. Well, that's great. Well, uh, you can find the Diffuse Congruence fan page as well at Facebook, and you can also find the show at iTunes and Stitcher Radio, and please do write us a review. Every bit of uh, guidance helps us. So on behalf of my colleague, Pervez Ahmed, my name is Zaki Hassan. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm. <laughs>